Hello and welcome to this talk about Bayesian inference. My name is Chris Mathis. I'm a professor of cognitive science at the Interacting Minds Center of Aarhus University in Denmark. In this talk, I will run you through the basics of probability and Bayesian inference. This is mostly about calculating with uncertain quantities and finding a logical way to do that. There's nothing more mysterious about it. We go beyond deductive logic, where we have a set of things that are assumed to be true. And from these things, by deductive logic, we find things that must be true because these first things were true, as we do when we find proofs in mathematics. We go beyond this here. We use inference. So we take things that we are not certain about and are brought with uncertainty, but we can quantify the uncertainty about them. And therefore we can still make quantitative statements about what they imply. And how to do that is the theory of Bayesian inference. Let us start with a surprising piece of information. Does chocolate make you clever? This was in the news about 10 years ago. The BBC, for instance, wrote, eating more chocolate improves the nation's chances of producing Nobel Prize winners. Or at least that's what a recent study appears to suggest. But how much chocolate do Nobel laureates eat, and how could any such link be explained? We will use this as a toy example. It's a slightly silly example, but the data behind it are real. So this is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, most prestigious medical journal uh, in existence. And it shows an impressive correlation between the chocolate consumption in a nation, kilograms per year per capita, here on the horizontal axis, and Nobel laureates per 10 million population here on the vertical axis. You can see correlation is about 0 0.8, impressively high, and the p-value is impressively low. We see an association that um, goes from low chocolate consumption to um, high chocolate consumption with Nobel Prizes per capita rising. Uh, lots of fun things can be seen here. Um, for instance, um, the Germans. Lots of chocolate eating, but not much effect on Nobel Prizes. On the other hand, the Swedes, they get lots of Nobel Prizes out of relatively little chocolate eating, which may have to do with uh, their being the ones handing out the Nobel Prizes. And then, of course, at the top right, you have Switzerland, and um, that uh, tells you where the author of the study came from. That's probably where he had the idea. So the question we will deal with in this slightly silly example is, will I win the Nobel Prize if I eat lots of chocolate? As a question referring to uncertain quantities, um, the kinds of quantities I, I spoke of in the abstract um, at the start. And like almost all scientific questions, this kind of question cannot be answered by deductive logic. And nonetheless, we can make quantitative statements about relations like this. However, these statements can only be given in terms of probabilities. So our question here can be rephrased in terms of a conditional probability. So what is the probability of winning a Nobel Prize given that I eat lots of chocolate I wrote here, but um, to be more precise, that I eat a certain amount of chocolate. So if I plug in 
a certain amount of chocolate here, 100 grams a day, 200 grams a day, two kilos a day. What do I know? Um, how does that affect my probability of winning a Nobel Prize? To answer questions like this, where we reason with uncertain quantities, we have to learn to calculate with them. And the tool for that is Bayesian inference. The basic setup is, um, as you probably learned in school, we deal with probabilities of outcomes that fall into uh, certain sets. So we say we have a probability space omega with subsets A and B. And in order to understand the, role, the rules of probability, we need to understand the three kinds of probabilities that we can all illustrate um, with this little Venn diagram here. These are marginal probabilities, like the probability of a unqualified. Joint probabilities, like the probability of A and B. So the event we're looking at um, belongs to categories A and B at the same time. And then conditional probabilities, so an outcome is already known to be in the set A. And now the question is, given that we know it is in A, what is now the probability that it is also in B? Let's first turn to marginal probabilities. So marginal probabilities are things like the probability of A yellow, like this. And this, these are the probability of any event in omega being in the set A. So we will return to marginal probabilities in a, in a context where they're um, slightly more interesting than this, but in basically they're just uh, super simple. Then joint probabilities, probability that a, an outcome is both in set A and in set B. So, what is marginal about marginal probabilities and then why are they called marginal probabilities? Let A be the statement the sun is shining and B be the statement it is raining. A bar negates A, so it's not A, and B bar is not B. Now, let's consider the following table of joint probabilities. We have A, um, not A, here in the rows of our table, and in the columns we have B and not B. The entries here in the table are joint probabilities. And the joint probability of A and B being true at the same time of 0.1. That's the probability that the sun is shining, but at the same time it is raining. Rather low probability of 0.1. Then our next entry here is the probability of A and not B. So the sun is shining and it is not raining. Then probability that the sun is not shining but it is raining. And finally, the probability that the sun is not shining and that um, it is raining at the same time. Now, note that all of these possibilities, you know, one of them always has to be true. So their probabilities have to add up to one. 0.5 plus 0.1 plus 0.2 plus 0.2, that is one. Now we can look at the margins of this table where we sum over the rows. So all probabilities where B is true. So we have to sum over B being true and at the same time A being true and not A being true, gives us a total sum of 0.3. And we do the same with the second column, where not B is true, and then first A is true, and not A is true, gives us a probability of 0.7. And now these are the probabilities of 
B being true, regardless of what A is, or B not being true, regardless of what A is. Because they are at the margins of the probability table, they are called marginal probabilities. We can play the same game with um, the rows here. Summing across rows gives us the marginal probabilities of A and of not A. And then again, um, summing up all the entries in the table um, amounts to the same as first summing up the columns and then summing up the row of um, summing up the rows and then summing up the column of row sums. That also gives us one. And if we do it the other way round, we um, sum up the columns and then sum up this row of column sums. It always gives us one. So marginal probabilities get their name for being at the margins of tables such as this one. And also about these um, probabilities, there's nothing very mysterious. So in the previous example, what is the probability that the sun is shining given that it is not raining? This kind of question places us in the realm of conditional probabilities. So formally, we can express this as the probability of A given not B. That is the question we're asking. And you can find the answer from looking at this table and asking yourself, out of all times where it is not raining, which proportion of times will the sun be shining? So out of all times where it is not raining, so that is not B, that is 0 0.7. That is the proportion of times where it is not raining, 0 0.7. And then out of these times, which proportion of times will the sun be shining? So that is this entry here, where the sun is shining and it is not raining. So out of 0 0.7, we take probability of 0 0.5, so we have the ratio of 0.5 to 0.7. So the conditional probability A given not B, that the sun is shining given that it is not raining, is around 0 0.71, 0.5 divided by 0.7. Considerations like these lead to the following definition of the rules of probability. So these axioms were formulated in the 1930s by Kolmogorov, and um, he basically reduced everything in probability to three axioms that we assume to be true. Um, we don't prove them, but we can show from experience, can be shown from experience that they work well. They work with what we take to be a probability. And so this is how they work. These are the three rules by which uh, probabilities work. Normalization is the first. All probabilities together, all entries in the probability table that we have, have to add up to one. If we marginalize and want to have the marginal probability of B, we have to sum up over all the joint probabilities of A and B. And if there's a third um, dimension across which we expand that probability table, then which will then be a probability um, cube, um, if you will then we have to sum up over all these other dimensions. So here we sum up over the dimension A and we get the marginal probability of B. Then conditioning, this um, is what we call the, pro uh, the product rule. We have the joint probability of A and B equals the conditional probability of A given B 
times the marginal probability of B. All the other way around, the conditional probability of B given A times the marginal probability of A. Immediately from this last axiom, from the product rule, we have the consequence of Bayes' rule. We take the last line we had, the product rule, and we divide by the marginal of B. This gives us Bayes' rule. So we just take this equation here, we divide by the probability of B to get this here, this is the first equality, and then we have the second equality here, which can be explained according to the product and sum rules together. Because first we expand the marginal of B and write it as the sum over the joint probabilities of B and all the possibilities of A. And then we additionally apply the product rule and take this apart into the joint probabilities here, all of them into the product of the conditional probability times the marginal probability of that particular outcome in uh, the set A. So what problem does it solve and why is it so important, um, this immediate consequence out of um, the third axiom of probability that we talk of Bayesian inference and you hear people speaking of Bayes rules all the time and everywhere. The importance of Bayes rules lies in the fact that it allows, to invert, uh, it allows us to invert conditional probabilities that it allows us to pass from the conditional probability of B given A to the conditional probability of A given B. So if we have at first only the conditional probability of B given A and the marginals of A and B, that allows us to calculate the conditional probability of A given B. In other words, Bayes' rule allows us to update our belief about A in light of an observation B. So we start out believing something about A. This is our initial belief about A. A probability distribution can always be interpreted as a belief. And then we make an observation B. And we have a model that tells us what the probability of the observation B is given a particular value of A. And then we also have the marginal probability of B. This is often the crux of the matter. These are hard to calculate the marginal probabilities that go into the denominator here. But if we have it, then we can immediately say what our new probability, our updated belief about A is given that we have now made the observation B. In our example, it is immediately clear that the probability of winning a Nobel Prize, given that one eats a certain amount of chocolate, is very different from the probability of eating a certain amount of chocolate, given that one has a Nobel Prize. So um, this may be very similar to the distribution in the population at large. And this may be, uh, this is a probability about um, 50 grams of chocolate or 100 grams of chocolate. Um, that um, is the distribution among Nobel Prize winners. Whereas here, this is a probability that is um, you know, between zero and one and just uh, telling us um, how likely someone who eats a certain amount of chocolate um, is to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, so these are two very different animals, even though they're just uh, 
sort of averse of each other. So no danger of confusing them here. In other cases, um, people often fall into the trap of confusing the two different um, versions of a conditional probability of A conditional on B and B conditional on A. Now, an important thing here is that the first conditional probability is hopeless to determine directly. The second is much easier to find. So if we tried to determine this directly, we would have to run a controlled experiment where we gave our participants a certain amount of chocolate to eat for years, decades. And then we look at whether they win a Nobel Prize or not. And because there are so few people winning Nobel Prizes, we would have to conduct this experiment perhaps over centuries until we have enough data to be confident about the probability of winning a Nobel Prize, given that one eats a certain amount of chocolate. So this is entirely unfeasible totally um, uh, crazy if we try to do and uh, to determine this directly. However, this quantity here, the probability of eating a certain amount of chocolate, given that one has a Nobel Prize, or given that one doesn't have a Nobel Prize, these are not that hard to determine. One could write to all Nobel Prize winners who are still alive and ask them how much chocolate you eat. Um, there may be limited success to that, but it's not it's not entirely unreasonable to do that and and to try and find um, the numbers um, that correspond to this con um, conditional probability. Then the base rate of Nobel winning, the mar uh, the yeah the marginal probability of a Nobel Prize, that's just the general probability in the population. So if uh, we grab someone at random from the street, what would the probability be that they have a Nobel Prize? That is fairly simple to determine. We take the number of uh, Nobel laureates alive and divide it by the population of the Earth. And that gives us a very small number. But then we have this base rate of Nobel winners. Here, the probability that in the population at large, people eat a certain amount of chocolate. This is a distribution that um, it would be somewhere to determine that, but probably the chocolate industry already has that. They, they've already found out um, how the distribution of chocolate eating is in the general population, because uh, that's important for them to know um, uh, in their efforts to sell chocolate. So. It's not unreasonable to assume we could determine all of the numbers the right, uh, on the right-hand side of the equation here. And that would allow us to determine the number on the left that would have been impossible, absolutely impossible to determine directly. The quantities that we have on the right here have some customary names. Um, this conditional probability there um, that contains our observations. So the observations of how much chocolate and Nobel Prize winners win uh, eat um, is called the likelihood. Our prior belief about Nobel winning, so before we ask a person how much chocolate they eat, after just randomly rounding them from the street, this is the prior probability. Um, that they um, have a Nobel Prize. And then this marginal probability is called the evidence. Sometimes also called the marginal likelihood uh, because you can calculate it by uh, marginalizing the likelihood. And to make a connection with SPM, the inference on the quantities of interest in neuroimaging studies has exactly the same general structure. What we get out of this on the left is our updated belief about Nobel winning once we know how much chocolate a person eats. And that is our posterior. When we speak of a model, of a generative model, a fully specified probabilistic model that is the combination of likelihood and prior.
These two together make a generative model. Before we have specified our whole likelihood and our whole prior, we do not actually have a model. In neuroimaging, the inference that we make is from a measurement to a hidden state of the brain that we are interested in. We want to know what is going on in the brain. But all we have to go on is some measurements we make. These can be fMRI recordings, this can be EEG recordings, whatever. So where we apply Bayesian inference is in calculating the posterior distribution where we have a state of the brain theta that we want to infer on and we have observations y. So given our observations y that are made here on the right and our model m, what was the state of the brain when we made these observations? In order to do that, we need a so-called forward model, a model that maps states of the brain onto observation. So given a certain state of the brain, theta and a model M, what is the probability of making a certain observation? So for instance, if we see activity in a certain region of cortex, we expect there to be a spike in the bold signal. We expect the, uh, the bold signal to go up. So the probability of seeing a higher bold signal, uh, so there's a probability distribution of the way the bold signal reacts, given that there is increased activity in that brain region. There's another illustration of exactly the same thing. The generative model is from brain states to observations and Bayesian inference goes the other way. So it takes the likelihood of observation given brain state and the prior on the brain state, turns it around using Bayesian inference to get to the brain state given the observation that we have now. I will next run you through a simple example of Bayesian inference. Um, this is this comes with an interactive Jupyter notebook that you can download at the URL here, um, and you can play around with that um, and see how it really works. The situation that um, we play around with there is that we have two manufacturers, A and B, they deliver the same kind of component that turns out to have the following lifetime in days, uh, the following lifetimes. So we record several lifetimes uh, of parts from manufacturer A and of parts from manufacturer B. And assuming prices are comparable, from which manufacturer would you buy? That's the question. We're going to try and decide which is the better manufacturer to buy from. I'll let you think about this for about five seconds, and then um, we're going to try and give a scientific answer to this question. In the course of doing that, we first take a detour. We first look at how not to analyze these data. Um, in order to illustrate the dangers of blindly applying recipes. So let's do a t-test. That's one of these recipes that um, people often um, get to know first in their uh, undergraduate statistics courses. When we're introduced to the t-test, we learn that there are different kinds of t-tests. There are equal variance t-tests and um, unequal variances t-test. And there's another test that tells us which of these tests to um, use. That's called an f-test, because an f-test compares variances. 
And if the variances are significantly different in the two samples, then we would apply an unequal variances t-test. If they're not significantly different, we stick with the equal variances t-test. So first, let us calculate the variance. Uh, compare the variances, I mean. Turns out they are not significantly different. The p-value is about one-third, and that is very far from um, any threshold of uh, significance. So we say, OK, we have to assume, because the hypothesis has not been rejected that the variances um, are different, we have to assume that they are the same. Uh, that's the best we can do. And we compare the means of the two samples that we have, the sample from A and the sample from B, and we see that also there we do not reach the conventional threshold of significance of 0.05. We are above that still, so the means are not significantly different. Now, if your boss asked you to make this decision about buying from A or from B, and you came back and said, well, look, um, I've done some statistical testing, and it turns out that statistically speaking, scientifically speaking, there is no difference between them. Um, so, so we can't decide whether to buy from A or from B, or we might toss a coin and um, buy from one or the other. Um, what is your boss likely to say? Well, he's likely to say, look, I can just eyeball these numbers and I can tell you whom I'd like to buy from. So what are these statistical procedures that tell you you can't decide this question? And your boss would be right, as we should see. So he wouldn't simply be... Um, using his prejudice and you would be scientific if you said we can't decide this question he would actually be right in what he said because this is very unsatisfactory you can you don't have to be that boss um, you can also just be yourself and um, decide that um, you know which one of these manufacturers um, is probably is the better one so let us turn to probability theory, to Bayesian inference, because Bayesian inference is simply probability theory. And let's see what we can say about this uh, example there. So we use a different procedure here. We don't apply, um, we don't go through sort of a, a flow chart of decisions about which recipes to apply. We first ask our question of interest. What is the probability that whatever? We specify our model. So, as I said, a fully specified model contains a likelihood and a prior. We justify our model from first principles and all prior predictive simulation. We will see what that is. Determine the posterior distribution and answer our question using the posterior distribution to do posterior predictive simulation. All of this is illustrated in detail in the notebook whose zero is given again here. This is how we specify our model. We are using uh, the programming language Julia with um, the Turing sampler there. And um, it's very simple to specify models like this. So what we say is we have a number of categories, in this case, just two, manufacturer A and B. And we have priors for each category. And we assume that these are Gaussians. And then we also have a Gaussian model for our observation. So you can see that's normal here and normal here. And finally, we need a distribution for the uncertainty sigma, our uncertainty about um, how different these 
um, manufacturers will be. And there we need a distribution that is for positive numbers only. So we take an exponential distribution. You don't need to worry about the details of this, um, how to specify such models um, to be found in, in many textbooks. And you can learn from examples like the one in this um, notebook that you can download. So we run a prior predictive simulation. And that means we invent fictitious manufacturers, eight manufacturers in total here. And we sample them and we sample lifetimes here. And we can see that there's a distribution of mean lifetimes. They're a bit different for each manufacturer. And then there's also a distribution of uh, variances, standard deviations or precisions, all the same um, concept, uh, easily convertible into each other for each manufacturer. So this is a manufacturer that's not very consistent. Sometimes their parts live long, sometimes they only have a short life. Um, this is a very consistent manufacturer here. This one is also um, very consistent, but of rather poor quality with short lifetimes and so on. And then we ask ourselves, does this roughly make sense? Given what we know from our two manufacturers, do, are they likely to be well represented here? Do we have any crazy extremes? No, we don't. Um, and uh, the distribution of both the means and the variances basically makes sense. So we proceed. We're happy with our prior predictive um, simulation. And then we formulate our question of interest. And here we say we want to know the probability that the mean lifetime of the path from B is more than three hours greater than that of the path from A. So if we can expect, if the mean value of the lifetimes from B is at least three hours longer than B, then we want to buy from B. But of course, we're dealing with probabilistic quantities here. So we can only deal, we can only give a probabilistic answer to that. So what is the probability of the mean lifetime of parts from B um, being more than three hours longer? And parts from A. And this is what in the end we get. Bayesian inference tells us that there is an 0.96 probability, a 96% probability of that lifetime from B being at least three hours longer than the lifetime from A. The t-test recipe said that the difference of means was not significant. But probability theory, so Bayesian inference says that under plausible assumption, there's a 96% probability that the mean of lifetime, mean lifetime of parts B is at least three days longer. And this tells you um, how you can be led astray by going through flow charts of recipes to apply. If you apply probability theory to the whole problem, you formulate it carefully, you do your prior predictive stimulation, you can then get much more powerful and much more um, sensible answers. Here we have the posterior distribution of the difference of means. So what is the distribution of the differences of the means of the path from A and the means of the path from B? Um, so delta means, as we write here. And our threshold was three hours, and that's about here. So we can see that 96% of the probability mass is above that. But it could be that we're wrong. We only had relatively small samples um, from A and from B, a bit more from A, a bit less from B. 
So it could still be that we're wrong, but the probability is only about 4% that um, we're wrong. But we could be, it's not inconceivable, not entirely inconceivable, that um, actually even the parts from A live longer in the mean than parts from B. And this is what this whole uh, posterior distribution of differences in means tells us. It gives us the full picture. It doesn't just give us a significant or not significant outcome. Now, we could go beyond the question we first asked and also ask, what is the probability that con components from manufacturer B have a longer lifetime than those from manufacturer A, in the sense that we at random take a um, component from A and a component from B, and then one, uh, determine the probability that um, the one from B or from A lives longer. Because as you saw in the previous slide, we were doing inference on the mean of the lifetimes because we were working in analogy to the t-test. That's what the t-test does. It compares, it compares means of samples. But actually, our actual question basically is the question our boss is asking us to answer. If we randomly pick a part from B or and one from A, which one is going to live longer and by how much? So we can come up with a decision rule. We can say if the components from B live three hours longer than those from A with a probability of at least 50%, I will choose those from B. And that's a rule that you can go and defend to your boss. To determine this, we need to look at the posterior predictive distribution. So we simulate fictitious parts that we let run on the basis of everything we know, on the basis of the data we have, and on the basis of our fitted model. So here we have the two distributions of simulated lifetimes of particles on the right in orange, uh, parts, not particles, parts from B, and on the left in blue, parts from A. And on the basis basis of these two distributions, we can now calculate the probability that a randomly chosen part from B will live at least three hours longer than a randomly chosen part from A. We do this calculation and we get the answer to the real question, the question that we are going to base our choice on. And this is it, 72% probability of parts from B living at least three hours longer than parts from A. So according to our decision rule, we should buy from B. But of course, we could have chosen another decision rule, and neither the data nor the statistical procedures can give us a decision rule. It is our background knowledge of the field that uh, has to determine that. Only you know what is at stake in a particular decision. So you have to come up with a decision rule on the basis of what is at stake. The data and the model do not tell you that. The whole picture is given by this posterior predictive distribution of differences in lifetime. So if you choose one particle from A and one particle from B at random, what is the distribution of differences in lifetime that you can expect? So you can see that um, if you go to a lifetime difference of three hours, you have a substantial portion of the probability mass higher than that. So that is 72% of the probability mass is above three hours. But of course, the distribution is relatively wide. We only have uh, relatively little data in our two samples. So sometimes you can get a much longer lifetime of the part from B, and sometimes you can even get um, 
a much longer lifetime of the particle from A, which would be indicated in a uh, large negative number. I will close on a note on uninformative priors. People often are afraid of introducing uh, biases into their modeling by choosing informative priors. The problem with that is that there is actually no such thing as an uninformative prior. Whatever prior you choose, you um, introduce information into your model. And using a so-called flat prior, um, which is sometimes referred to as an uninformative prior, does not lead to inferences that are more data-driven. So the choice of prior is just part of your modeling. Priors are a part of your model just as the likelihood, what people often refer to as the model proper, but the priors just uh, belong to that just as much. And interestingly, people often don't really justify the likelihood that they choose. So when they do a t-test, they don't go to great lengths of justifying that. Um, but then they agonize over the priors. Um, and, and there's something off about that because both parts need to be justified. And the way to justify them, by the way, is uh, using prior predictive simulation, as we did here. So if your prior predictive simulation makes sense, then your model is fine. Well, at least in that respect, it is fine. So for an example of what uninformative or so-called uninformative priors can do to your inference. If you're studying a small effect in a noisy setting using a flat prior, it means assigning the same prior probability mass to the interval covering effect size of minus one to plus one, which are plausible effect sizes for such a study, as to that covering effect sizes plus 999 to plus 1001, which are massively implausible. So, and you don't want to do that. You, you want to um, keep your prior predictive distribution in a range that makes sense. So far from being unbiased, this amounts to a bias in favor of implausibly large effect sizes. So using flat priors is asking for the kind of replicability crisis that uh, we've been seeing over the past about one and a half decades in some fields. So put another way, priors are, which are too uninformative amount to an implausible prior predictive distribution. And one way to address this is to collect enough data to swamp the inappropriate priors. The problem doesn't arise um, as long as you can overwhelm your inappropriate priors with loads of data. Um, but a cheaper way than um, having to overwhelm your inappropriate priors is to start with appropriate priors to begin with. And one problem of classical tests is that they often imply flat priors. Also in a Bayesian context though, priors which are too flat are common because they can give a higher model evidence. So if you blindly go by um, the scores that your model have on the AIC or the BIC or the WAIC or uh, the negative variational free energy, um, then this may lead you to use priors that are actually too flat, too wide. And the way to find that out is, again, by prior predictive simulation. Your prior predictive simulation has to be plausible. A quick run through applications of Bayesian inference in neuroimaging. It is ubiquitous. So we have it in um, pre-processing, uh, posterior probability maps, segmentation and normalization that refers to pre-processing, dynamic causal modeling, multivariate decoding. Um, here's the example of uh, segmentation, fMRI time series analysis, um, dynamic causal modeling as mentioned, and model comparison for group studies is another example where we use this in neuroimaging. So Bayesian inference is everywhere, 
especially everywhere where you cannot do without informative priors because your estimates don't converge otherwise. That is all I have. Thank you very much for bearing with me.